Welcome to the belated celebration of the publication uh, a little over a year ago of Maurice Samuel's book, The Right to Difference, French Universalism and the Jews, um, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2016, which you can buy in all good bookstores of the same French, and at the book culture table here. Um, this book is very tiny and it sits at the intersection of two important contemporary set of debates in France. And to some extent the US. Debates that have first debates that have emerged in the middle of the 1980s in France and also on very different terms in the American Academy about the nature and historical role of French, univers of French universalism and the status it accords to minorities with a specific emphasis in the French debate and the American debate on Islam in France. And second, a second series of difficult debates over the resurgence of anti-Semitism in France in the past 15 years, its origin, its novelty, or on the contrary, its connection to much older debates, I mean, sorry, to much older forms of anti-Semitism that may have never gone very far. Contrast the tendency to reify the ahistoric uh, French Republican model, a passion at the heart of many French PhD students' vocation. <laughs> Samuel's main contribution in his book is to historicize French universalism and to show that its varying forms are sometimes including a certain dose of pluralism. It does so by insisting that since the revolution and up until today, Specific configurations of universalism in France have mostly hinged on debates over the place of Jews in French society. We are delighted to have Professor Samuels, Betty Jane Elhenley, and Professor of French and Chair of the French Department at Yale University, and author of two other major books, The Spect Spectacular Past, Popular History and the Novel in 19th Century France, published by Carmel in 2004, and Inventing the Israelite. Jewish Fiction in 19th Century France, published by Stanford in 2010. So we'd like to have you in this book tonight. To accompany us in the reading of this often dazzling overview of the recent history of Jews in France and its relationship to universalism, we have three commentators whose proper, <laughs> whose proper presentation would fit the rest of this panel. I'm really happy that tonight I was not allowed to be late. <laughs> So, uh, to remain within the limits of the reasonable, let me say simply that we have the privilege to hear three voices whose work has intersected the French Jewish question in different times and different locations. First, Susan Rubin Suleiman, uh, C. Douglas Dillon, Professor of the, Civilization, of the Civilization of France and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard University, and author of many, many books about French pluralism and French Jews. Among them, most recently, the Nemirovsky question, the life, death, and legacy of a Jewish writer in 20th century France, published by Yale University Press in 2016, which is also uh, for sale here at the book culture table. Thank you, book culture. And a book that had the um, rather rare privilege of being uh, immediately translated into France, into French, and received a very uh, large press coverage and lots of uh, lots of rich in France under the title La question Nemi Rovsky by uh, published by Abba Michel in uh, the fall of 2017. Second, Clémence Boulouk, who is Carl and Bernice Witten assistant professor in Jewish and in Israel studies here at Columbia. Yeah. Her research interests include Jewish thought and mysticism and their intersection with psychoanalysis and the arts. The former radio host a trans culture and book critic for Le Chicago. She's also the author of several novels and essays published by Gallimard. And last but not least, my dear colleague, Elizabeth Lidenson, professor of French and comparative literature and general editor of Roman Review. She is the author of two books, Proust's Les Lesbianism, uh, published by Carmel in 1989, and Dirt for Art's Sake, Books on Trial from Lolita to Madame Bovary, also published by Carmel in 2007. 
She's also the author of many essays on uh, a wide range of subjects in journals including Yale French Study, the Yale Review, and the London Review of Books. She is currently finishing a book about Colette. So thank you to um, the three of you for commenting on this, on this book tonight. And now to Professor Maurice Samuels for a short presentation of this book. Thank you very much. So first, I'd like to really say thank you to Emmanuel Sadat and Clemence Boulouk uh, for organizing this panel, which is uh, so nice of them, uh, and Susan Suleman and Elizabeth Ladenson for agreeing to be on it. Um, these are, uh, I don't know Clemence at all. I go way, way back with uh, Susan and Elizabeth, and this is part of a kind of ongoing conversation around these topics. Um, and I, I look forward to it. And I know it's a really busy time of the year for everybody, including everyone here, and I'm grateful for all of you uh, for taking the time to engage with my book. Um, I'm, of course, also grateful to Shannon Peer, to Alex Cutler, the Maison Francaise, and to Charlie Knapp for making the event happen. So I thought I would talk for about 10 minutes about the book, uh, how I came to write it, and what I was trying to do, and then turn it over to the panelists. Um, in 2011, I took over a program devoted to studying anti-Semitism at Yale. Over the next few years, I organized a lot of conferences and lectures, many of them focused on France, which, as I'm sure everyone here realizes, has had more attacks on Jews than any other country in recent years. But I found myself growing annoyed in many of these discussions, in many of the discussions following these talks, when people in the audience would assume, and, and this was pretty frequent, that France is an inherently anti-Semitic country. Sure, Fran French history has been punctuated by moments of intense anti-Semitism. The Dreyfus Affair and Vichy come to mind. But France has also, in the modern period, been more open to Jews than almost any other country. France was the first European country to give Jews full civil rights in 1790 and 91. In the 19th century, when Jews were denied access to most universities and professions in Europe, when they were still barred from holding public office in many American states, Jews in France faced no legal barriers to integration. As Pierre Birnbaum has shown, French Jews were especially numerous in government administration and in the army in the 19th century, which was certainly not the case in most other countries, including the US. And this remarkable record of openness to Jews continued into the 20th century. France has had five Jewish prime ministers, uh, or five prime ministers of Jewish origin, beginning with Léon Blum in 1936. I wanted to set the record straight, so I originally set out to write a book about French philo-Semitism, the defense, love, or admiration of Jews and Judaism. Uh, Joe, you know, I would tell people that that's what I was working on. People would say, oh, great, it's going to be a very short book. <laughs> but, you know, as the case was, it turned into like a very long and complicated book. And I actually spent a couple of years writing that book until I realized I wasn't actually interested in philo uh, As a concept, it seemed to me too slippery. It seemed to involve an element of psychologizing that I, I wasn't comfortable with. Um, and if I was really going to analyze the phenomenon of philo-Semitism, I was faced with having to explore all kinds of things like fundamentalist Christian love for Israel, uh, which didn't really apply to the French case. Eventually I realized that I was actually interested in one specific kind of philo-Semitism, uh, French philo-Semitism, the universalist kind. And this arguably wasn't a form of philo-Semitism at all, because it's predicated not on a specific love for Jews, but on the principle that one law applies to all citizens equally, regardless of race and religion, and that all citizens should be treated equally by the state. It was the commitment to a radical form of universalism, I realized, that really defined the French case. It was commitment to this principle that led to the emancipation of Jews during the French Revolution and to the success of Jews in French national life in the centuries that followed. But I also realized that this very commitment to universalism has often made it hard for Jews and other minorities to express their difference in the public sphere in France. 
There's a very widespread conception uh, that French universalism entails the radical separation of churches and state, and the state's refusal to recognize minority ethnic or religious communities. Indeed, this is what most people think defines the specificity of the French case. And here the comparison with the United States is instructive. The US also sees itself as a universalist country with equal rights for all, but it has allowed for a much greater presence of religion in the public sphere than France. And it has no problem thinking in terms of ethnic and religious communities, and even, in the case of affirmative action, allowing for special rights for members of certain ethnic groups. Uh, all of that is very problematic in France. So I set out to write a book about French universalism and the Jews, and I eventually realized three main things. First, that universalism has not always meant the same thing to all people. What we take to be its meaning today is really only the latest incarnation of a principle and an ideology that has always been open to debate and negotiation. In other words, universalism has a history. Second, this history is very often unfolded through writing and debate about Jews. Although Jews were only ever a tiny minority of the French population, never more than 1%, they have played an outsized role in the way that the French think about questions of national identity. This became true during the French Revolution, when the revolutionaries used the question of Jewish emancipation to raise fundamental questions about the individual and the state, and it remains true today, as Jews have very frequently been at the center of debates about terrorism in France. My third realization was that, it, was that if we trace this history of thinking about Jews in France, we realize that the universal and the particular have not always been as opposed as we think they are today. In fact, at various times in French history, writers and politicians, but also philosophers and filmmakers, have attempted to reconcile the universal and the particular, and to show how minority difference can be a conduit rather than an obstacle to the universal. So the book is organized chronologically, and it looks at various key moments in French history when the status of the Jews was up for debate. I try to show where different theorists of Jewish difference fit on what I see as a spectrum between, on the one side, a kind of hardline universalism predicated on assimilation or the erasure of difference, and on the other, a more open, pluralistic model that embraces difference in some form. I start with debates about giving Jews citizenship during the French Revolution and show that even Jacobins like Robespierre, whom we think of as having instituted the hardline form of universalism that seeks to erase all minority particularity, were actually quite open to Jewish difference. They don't demand that Jews shed their cultural and religious particularity as a precondition for citizenship. And the actual decree emancipating the Jews made no reference to assimilation even as a goal. I then turn to the case of the French Jewish actress, Rachel Félix, who was the star of the Comédie Française in the 1830s and 40s, and became famous for playing the heroines of Racine and Corneille, while also, while also playing up her Jewishness. I show that while some of her critics thought that a Jew could never interpret the heroines of the French theatrical, theatrical canon, others thought that it was Rachel's Jewishness that allowed her to understand these classically French roles. The third chapter shifts to colonial Algeria and the ways that France played the indigenous population of Muslims and Jews against each other, eventually giving citizenship to the Jews because of their perceived ability to assimilate French cultural norms while excluding the much larger community of Muslims. I show how we see the roots of a hardline form of universalism predicated on the erasure of difference here. But also, if we look more closely, we see how French Jews in the metropole, so in France, use their advocacy on behalf of the Algerian Jews to assert their difference in the French public sphere. 
The next chapter focuses on Zola and the Dreyfus affair, and here I show that the great writer very clearly does predicate his defense of the Jew on a hope that Jewish difference will ultimately disappear in France. It was the Dreyfus affair that led to the separation of churches in the state in 1905, to which many trace the hardline form of universalism at work in France today. But I also show how some dissent from this model, including chapter five on the 1937 Renoir film La Grande Illusion, which shows a Jewish officer, uh, how a Jewish officer is incorporated into the symbolic community of French soldiers in spite of or along with his difference. Chapter six focuses on Sartre's famous post-World War II essay, Réflexion sur la question juive, translated as anti-Semite and Jew, which I read as an attack on the hardline assimilationist form of universalism of Zola, although at the end it bears certain resemblances to it. The final chapter examines responses to recent Islamist uh, anti-Semitism in France by opposing two French thinkers, uh, or by uh, two opposing French thinkers, Alain Finkelkraut and Alain Badiou, one on the center right and one on the far left, who both call for a kind of hardline universalism as the solution to the problem of exaggerated communal identification, so what, what the French call communitarianism. <coughs> the conclusion briefly then looks at responses to the attacks on Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket from 2015, and particularly at a speech by the former French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, which I see as containing a glimmer of a more open model of universalism. Although I don't take on the issue of what recovering this complicated history of Jews and universalism might tell us about how France should treat its much bigger community of Muslims, I do suggest that understanding universalism not as a stable or fixed ideology but rather as a process might be a good place to start. Uh, and I'll stop there and turn it over. So I've been asked to go first, which is nice, because, uh, although I think I'll, I'll repeat a few things that Maury said, but he spoke very fast. So I just want to say that, uh, that I'm very glad to be here and that I've read this book in pieces before, but last yesterday, as I told Maury when we had a coffee earlier, I sat down and spent the whole day reading the whole book from cover to cover. And it was a very interesting experience. You know, you really get to see the shape of the work, and I do think it hangs together very well. Uh, um, I can say this as a former teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, I, I would like to suggest, though, that there's something about the arc of the book, or the arc of the argument of the book, which becomes very interesting, and you'll see in a minute what I have in mind. But So just to resume, or just to, to restate what Maury uh, already said, but, but it's worth restating, the, he makes kind of, you know, he, he makes a three-pronged argument, which kind of uh, is, the, is the guiding thread in this book. On the one hand, that uh, French universalism is not a single monolithic entity, but a project that evolved over time, that, that it has a history. And I think that this is a very, very strong point. Uh, and it is also a critique of a certain tendency uh, to reify and vilify French universalism. In other words, people just say, ah, the French, they, they imagine the subject, the political subject, or just the subject, uh, as this abstract thing without a body, without a, without a history, without a past, or, or anything. Uh, uh, and so it's very, it's very easy to, to sort of throw darts at this conception of universalism. And what Maury undertakes to do is to show, well, it's not, it, it's not quite so simple. Uh, universalism has evolved over time, and there are debates about exactly what includes it and what doesn't. So, uh, the next um, point is also a very strong one, uh, which is this evolution has taken place first and foremost as a discourse on the place of Jews in French society. In other words, that Jews present the sort of challenge, or historically, they are the people, because they have always been considered as the ultimate other, uh, not just in France, but in European culture and society, as we know, 
Uh, so they have been the they have been the crux of the question. Now I would say that's very strong, but as you yourself gestured at the end, Maury, nowadays of course that whole issue has been displaced toward the other other, the much more uh, problematic other uh, at the moment, which is the Muslim population. So, uh, so this is a huge topic, and people have just spent a lot of uh, spilled a lot of ink talking about are the Muslims the new Jews? In other words, just like the the discourse in the 30s was the Jews will never be like us. They're inassimilable. Uh, they're weird. That they, they will never be French. Uh, this was an anti-Semitic uh, talk in the 30s. Uh, so now we have the Muslims are not like a, some people say, no, you can't really compare the two because the Jews never placed bombs, they never destroyed things. But you see, it's a huge problem. So, uh, so I would say that, that uh, you know, this evolution that's taken place first and foremost about Jews is true until about 20 or 25 years ago. And then it suddenly shifts and becomes much more uh, difficult, uh, complicated. Um, and then the third point uh, is that universalism and particularism have not always been opposed. There's a way in which particularism can be included in a kind of a universalist conception. So I think that this is almost like a corollary of number one. In other words, if universalism has a history and is an evolving project, then clearly one of its possibilities is that particularism can be included. Now, in the chapters that follow this introductory statement, uh, Maury demonstrates very persuasively that there have indeed been moments in the history of the universalist idea in France when difference, and in particular Jewish difference, was seen as compatible with integration into the national community. The fact that they were weird didn't prevent them from being uh, full French citizens. And, and uh, uh, and so, as you as you mentioned, Maury, uh, the this this idea of these moments are moments that Maury calls moments of pluralism. <coughs> that is, if you have a spectrum where it's full assimilation, where Jews disappear, uh, is on one end, then pluralism would be on the other end, where Jews dif difference can still be integrated and understood as part of the nation. Uh, and what interests uh, him is the way that pluralism could be manifested in specific writings uh, or more generally cultural productions like film or performance at a given time. And I think we didn't mention this, we didn't have time, but I think that uh, the way you define uh, your method is very nice, uh, which is, quote, the close reading of texts, but always with an eye fixed on the historical horizon. So Maury is very good at this kind of bifocal reading, you know, looking at the text and looking at its very specific details, but keeping your mind on what's going on. So, and I like to think that it has something to do with your, with your education in history and literature at Harvard. Uh, uh, but so the way that that you move from a specific textual commentary to examining the larger discourse that surrounds a specific work, for example, and then back to the text is really, really very lovely. Uh, I think this is perhaps most evident in, in the chapter on Jean Renoir's great, great film from 1937, uh, La Grande Illusion, uh, The Grand Illusion. Uh, um, you know, the, the question that, that Maury deals with there is what did moviegoers during those very xenophobic years of the, of the late 1930s make of the figure of the Jewish French POW officer whose name was Rosenthal as portrayed by, uh, by Renoir. And as Maury shows, Rosenthal stands out among the other French officer prisoners by his name by all the various ways in which he is not like them. He's very wealthy, very, you know, the, the rich Jew. Uh, so he, he corresponds to some stereotypes, the very rich Jew. He also looks different. He's a little bit more feminine than the great uh, hard hero, uh, Gabin, uh, played by a Jewish actor, Nasser uh, So. 
so that he kind of uh, feeds into stereotypes about Jews. But uh, at the same time, and I think this is very interesting, he is shown in the film to be, nevertheless, despite all of this, he is still a member of the national community. He and, I don't know if you remember the film, but you know, he and Gabba escape and uh, constitute a kind of mini, mini French community. And there are many other moments in the film where, where we see Rosenthal being part, one of the boys. Uh, so, so, so I think that's a very interesting argument. And, um, uh, and, yet, and then what's very important also, though, is to recognize the possibility that individual viewers did not necessarily read the film that way. In other words, and Maury does that, uh, that it's, it's that in other words that <clears throat> no matter what a filmmaker's intention would have been, uh, there's no control. You kind of lose control over your work once it goes out into the public. So it's conceivable that for some uh, very anti-Semitic viewers, Rosenthal would just confirm all their prejudices. Um, and I resonated to this particularly because in the book that Emmanuel mentioned, the, the Nemirovsky question, it's about Ivan Nemirovsky, which was a kind of a controversial writer, in fact, because some people who read her novels about Jews think of them as anti-Semitic. Uh, so my whole project in the book was to show how I read them. And I don't, I think that they are very interesting because they raise these issues of how we look and how Jews look at each other, which is, of course, another thing which doesn't occur here because Rosenthal is the only Jew in the film. Uh, so what did I mean then when I said that Maury's arc is, is a little odd? Well, I should say that the Gabin film, the, uh, the Renoir film, echoes that earlier chapter on Hachel, which also shows that you have this very Jewish actress in the 19th century who proclaimed herself as a Jew and yet was adored uh, by the public. Uh, but at the same time, there were, of course, people who hated her and who vilified her and said a Jew can never play Hasid uh, uh, because Jews just don't understand French uh, So what do I mean by the art? And then I'll stop. Uh, um, well, uh, I think we can look at that if we look at his essay on Safa. What, what Maury shows in the essay on Safa is that Safa basically in the thing on, on the, you know, it's a, a book by Sartre called Anti-Semite and Jew in English, uh, Reflexion sur la question juive. A very interesting book. Uh, <coughs> what Maury shows is that Sartre really criticizes the universal subject uh, and the notion of sort of let the Jews blend in uh, and, become, and disappear uh, into this assimilation. Uh, he criticizes that, that uh, notion very strongly in, in part of the book. Uh, um, and for this, many Jewish readers at the time were extremely grateful to him uh, because they, it, his analysis made it possible for them to identify themselves as Jews and as French at the same time. So you have great people like Lanzmann uh, and Pierre Vidal Naquet who said, you know, when I read that book, I decided that I could be, I could show, I could, I could affirm myself as a Jew in France. This was right after World War II. Uh, but then Maury also shows uh, uh, very nicely that in the last part of Safa's Reflexion, uh, Safa goes back into a Zola mode, into a, into a total assimilationist mode, because he says after the revolution, you know, he was writing this as a Marxist at the time, uh, after the revolution we will have a society where all different, all classes will disappear, religion will disappear, the Jews will be just like us. <laughs> you know, they, were, they will be absorbed, uh, uh, which is also what Zola had in mind, right? So, so there you go. Uh, uh, even Sato, the great critic of universalism, ends up sort of uh, seeing the future as uh, the Jews will be absorbed. Um, and that understanding leads to the end of Maury's own book, because that occurs at the very end of Salford's book. At the end of Maury's own book, here's a sentence. There have been models of universalism that allow for difference throughout French history. 
but they have been more the exception than the rule. Now, if the pluralist moments have been exceptions, even if important ones, what does that suggest about the future, especially when French society struggles not with the Jewish question today, but with the much thornier Muslim question? Uh, so that's why I think that your arc, in a way, starts out as very optimistic and positive, but ends on a somewhat more tentative note. Um, and I'll stop there. There are specific questions, but we can come back. for this book once. So um, as I was reading Morris and Noel's The Right to Difference, I was reminded of another collection of miniatures, um, miniatures that were assembled by 20th century Viennese writer Stefan Zweig. Uh, when he published in 1927, Stern von der Menschheit, which was first translated very, uh, with a very pedestrian title, Decisive Moments in History and has since then gained a new title, Shooting Stars. So its slide depicts a constellation of events that led to such decisive changes. And in his book, which is obviously more literary than Tolly, uh, slide tells of a few historical events um, that changed the world. It is Napoleon at Waterloo, but it's also good uh, writing the Marian Bad Elgy. So slide draws our attention to the obvious turning points, the great battles, um, but also to these events that would be barely perceptible unless one is able to decipher what the arts have to say about our, about society. And so if someone's able to do so too, it is um, Morris Emmels. So likewise, his book covers a revolution, the Dreyfus affair, but also um, um, small masterpieces, um, uh, the Noir's Great Illusion, and all those vignettes um, weave together as a story of French Jews and also French Judaism. So it is this bifocal method that Suzanne has just talked about uh, that is very striking. It is an exercise in micro and macro history at the same time. And one that seems particularly fitting, um, maybe because any grand narrative of French universalism um, now sounds like a broken one, or maybe because extolling the virtues of French universalism uh, in this, you know, most you know, pugnacious way has become politically fraught um, and comes across as a super, uh, suspicious uh, far-right attempt to dismiss minorities, i.e. Um, the Muslims um, today. So instead of looking at the grand narrative, Maurice Samuels looked closer, and this is how the book becomes a kaleidoscope. So you can rearrange the stories um, in a way that's not linear, and the chapters, um, and so some new shape um, end up emerging. And at the same time, you have the kaleidoscope effect, but also the spectrum on which you see all the variations of universalism. And together, um, it really felt like the studies uh, create a counter discourse, um, a sort of instance of history against the grain, and really an invitation to uh, look back in order to um, look ahead and think about universalism anew, um, not just as an erasure of difference. So today, I would like to focus on two chapters, two moments of the book and of the French Jewish saga. Both are in the 19th century, so there's something almost um, refreshing about the 19th century. We know uh, in retrospect what was about to happen, but there is still some sort of optimism about it. Um, so the two episodes are the sense of this French um, Jewish star, Hachel Felix, and the thorny question of universalism in Algeria, which is the first colony in North Africa that was not uh, plantation based. And both of these moments uh, take place roughly at the same time. They start during the same decade um, in the 1830s. So the French troops arrived in Algeria in July 1830 um, during the, last, the very last days of the Restoration. And Mademoiselle Rachel triumphed in the famous play by Racine Esther in 1839. She just um, she was um, 18. So this is a time of uh, the monarchy Julia, which is a liberal uh, constitutional monarchy that ended with the revolution of 1848, the People's Spring, um, and a really I mean, a tidal wave of nationalism. 
But the juxtaposition of an and quasi simultaneity of this episode cannot give a better glimpse into the differences and highlight really the complicated and sometimes contradictory nature of this universalism that's at the core of the book. It is not just that it changed over time, which it did, but it's also that universalism is by definition almost regal with tensions. Um, and in a way, um, Jews are a rational test of what uh, one means by universalism. So let's turn our attention to uh, Hashem. Um, Marcellus gives voice both to our enemies, uh, which were plenty, and to those who responded to the attacks um, leveled at her and formulated in, the, in, in doing so um, real pluralistic universalism, which is again very different from what uh, people have come to think as a you know, signature French and transition model of an erasure of difference. So Rachel's sense has to be understood as part of the prominence of the Jews uh, in cultural life in France in the 1830s, you know, Meyerbe, music, Fremontal uh, Alevi. Um, in the book, you zero in on um, performing arts, um, but Jewish presence in the liberal literature is also noteworthy. So the novelist Jenny Foix, um, about whom you wrote extensively in your previous book, uh, was also the, friend, the first French from, uh, Jewish woman writer, and her titles were unambiguously Jewish, such as the Kiddushim, which was also arguably using some sort of Orientalist appeal. So what is really remarkable is that Hashem Felix does not fit the bill for that kind of Orientalism, and she does not even fit the bill for um, the Belgian, the beautiful Jewess, you know, this kind of compliment that is so um, loaded and anti-Semitic. Um, that the Tribula Rochelle fell prey to that kind of temptation. So the tale that was spun about her is that she came from a poor immigrant family whose, um, whose parents um, barely spoke French, that she never took acting classes, um, and that could not be further from the truth. Um, but her, and so her haters, um, as you show, claim that the Jews did not only fail to assimilate in French culture, but that they made French culture Jewish. So that almost reminds us of, you know, uh, and like in this kind of delirium of, you know, I'm going to enjuive Judaize uh, France um, and French culture, which is the ultimate, um, uh, the ultimate goal. So, but what you show is, and you bring up, is the case of the writer Jean Janin, who initially really criticized her, and then went on, to, went on to rave about her talent. And the change of heart is really revealing. Um, great, Rachel is actually a miracle, but she could only be a French miracle, because only France can make space for people like her, uh, who did not seek to hide her identity, and who actually brought her identity um, to enrich. Um, French, um, I mean French, French community. So incidentally, I'd like to add that Esther is a case study. Is that is a case study on many levels. The play itself was one of the first plays translated into Hebrew around the same time. It is actually more an adaptation than a translation. Uh, it was in 1827, 1843. Uh, the German uh, <coughs> Jewish proponents of the Enlightenment were eager to show that there is a common denominator between Jewish and European culture and that the arts, and especially the theater, were evidence of this. So they were able to show that Esther actually uh, manifested this um, common and this shared um, values. So for that kind of proponents of a universalism uh, that would be compatible with specific identities, uh, the equation is very simple. The more French, the more Jewish, and vice versa. The more Jewish, the more French. So these are not mutually exclusive identities. It is just a conjunction, and even the addition of two universalisms, um, Jewish universalism and French universalism. So that's really a parenthesis in um, both histories, but this is really important to um, say it again. Um, as Maurice and Mills, um says, I mean, um, um, captures it, Mademoiselle Hachel was as famous as the Rothschilds. And if you think that's a little overstated, I have come across the verses that follow her death, uh, written by the very influential British uh, critic and poet Matthew Arnold. I'm going to give you um, a flavor of what he wrote. Germany, France, Christ, Moses, Athens, Rome, the strife, 
the minister in our soul are ours. Our genius and our glory are our own. So um, the poem was written in 1867, uh, which is only nine years after her premature death. Um, and she was really given an afterlife in his poetry. And he made her an instance of the creativity that can be found in, so, uh, in such a multi-layered um, identity. And the lineal identities are actually where um, the genius uh, lies, and, and the French genius uh, to boot. Uh, the phrase, the mixture is ours, is quite arresting. It defines what was understood as uh, um, the strength of universalism, which is um, this um, specific combination where both the individual and community become stronger because of um, each other. Um, you also mentioned the lesser known performers like Madame Nathan Trailer, Madame Mademoiselle Julian, Madame Auguste Tifla, and all those actors whose name have uh, sunk into oblivion. I would also have loved to see how a couple of decades, decades later, uh, the discourse in Sarah Bernard, uh, who was so dear to Proust, compared to the tales that were um, you know, spread on, on her shed. Um, the chapter ends before this. Um, before um, uh, Saadam comes about um, and which are in later decades of the century. But the question remains, what kind of affinity is there between Jews and performing, performing as Jews? Can Jewishness or Jewish identity be seen as a performance or any kind of identity for that matter? So these are open questions, but that are questions that the book um, offers. Um, this brings me to another play in another chapter in the book, the following chapter, Les Juifs de Constantine by Théophile Gautier, which opened in 1846 and closed almost immediately. Um, but whose merit, um, if it has one merit, because it, you know, it was pretty um, uh, uh, bad, <laughs> we can say so, is to counter up the ideology of the colonial project and give a completely different take and universalism. That would be the anti hashed kind of universalism. So Algeria was a testing ground for this notion, and as we see, um, it is a non-inclusive universalism that came about and that was used as a wedge um, to, do, to drive a wedge between the Jews and the Muslims, um, and really constructing the Jews as eager to assimilate versus the Muslims who resisted that civilizing, civilizing um, um, civilizing mission. Uh, it is also um, noteworthy because it's the first encounter between a Western emancipated community and a traditional community of Eastern Jews, which became a concern uh, in the 20th century in France and Germany, uh, with the influx of East European Jews called the Oriental Jews or uh, Ostuban, and the idea that the you know the emancipated communities were not too happy to see those parts of uh, people who spoke at this was an accent that would trigger more anti-Semitism. So it's really uh, interesting to see how Jews in France had internalized uh, Orientalism and took upon themselves uh, that they had an educational mission, which the Alliance Israelite Universelle stands for. So again, you see the French universalism and the Jewish universalism that uh, joined strength. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have enough time to speak more about all those fascinating aspects of the book. Uh, it is an important one. Um, but much like Ethan Katz has done with Jews and Muslims and the burdens of brotherhood, um, it also rejects the binaries and the sound bites that were being fed on a daily basis. Um, so I'll just uh, conclude with a nod to Salo Baran, the historian at Colum the Colombia historian uh, in his history of the Jews who uh, famously lamented the lacrimose history of the Jews. Um, so there can be a lacrimose history of universalism as it relates to the Jews, whether one is loudly mourning it uh, in the finger cut way, or whether one is shedding tears of anger over how biased it is. Um, and so the book uh, does not elicit tears at all, and its great contribution is to show how fluid the notion is uh, by reading history against the grain, by looking forward, um, and by finding those shooting stars of French Jewish history, which expands our understanding of French uh, history altogether. So, <clears throat> um, 
I'm tempted to start by saying that I'm not, I don't actually plan on speaking for very long, but when academics do that, they <laughs> always end up speaking for hours and hours and have to be dragged away from the microphone. So I don't know. I'm, I'm actually not planning on, I don't have that much to say, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so uh, I, uh, first of all, would like to say um, how interesting this book is. You should all come and buy a copy immediately if you already have several. Um, <laughs> to all of your friends. Um, it's very interesting. I particularly, there's one part that I just thought was so great. I mean, just so um, beautiful. Such a just such a beautiful example of uh, just everything. Um, which is that Rachel was viewed as too Jewish to play Hasim's instead. <laughs> that, that is my favorite. Um, my favorite part. Um, so I think I'm, what I, the main thing that I have to say is that I think there's a big tension inherent in, um, I, and I'm basically um, going to elaborate on what Susan um, uh, adumbrated. Um, uh, uh, I think there's a big, there's a, a tension at the center of this book, which is, um, uh, as Susan pointed to the difference between the introduction and the conclusion, I would say that, um, what, so your introduction sets out to do something um, that I think your demonstration kind of belies. Um, and so uh, since I was taught to read in this way, I'm just going to uh, do that. Um, uh, so, for, so first of all, I want to quote from the introduction. Um, you, you went over this um, uh, to, to um, and you talked about being a, a um, about part of this project stemming from your experience as director of our Center uh, for the Study of Anti-Semitism and, and people um, assuming that, um, that uh, the assumption that, that I quote that France was a fundamentally, even inherently anti-Semitic country, not only, so this is pages six and seven, not only does such an assumption tend to collapse different kinds of anti-Semitism into one unchanging eternal entity that frustrates analysis, but it also happens not to be true. France may have witnessed its share of anti-Semitism, but it is not inherently anti-Semitic. If it were, how then to explain the fact that France was the first European country to grant the Jews full civil rights in the 18th century? Or that in the 19th century, French Jews achieved far greater social and economic integration than their co-religionists anywhere else in the world? Or that in the 20th century, France had no fewer than five prime ministers of Jewish origin? Moreover, the paragraph concludes, if France were inherently anti-Semitic, why did French intellectuals like Émile Zola and Jean-Paul Sartre produce some of the most forceful condemnations of anti-Semitism ever written? Um, now, these are meant as rhetorical questions, um, I strongly suspect, uh, but I'm going to just go ahead and, and answer them. Um, I think that, because I think there are actual answers to these questions. Um, how then to explain the fact that France was the first European country to grant the Jews full civil rights in the 18th century? Well, you've, you've pointed out it's because the uh, revolution set out to do something that inadvertently led them to give citizenship to um, uh, civil rights uh, and eventually citizenship to the Jews. I don't think this was their, their, the point. It was a peculiar and problematic byproduct of an entirely different um, program that had nothing to do with the Jews, or that in the 19th century, French Jews achieved far greater social and economic integration than their co-religionists anywhere else in the world, or that in the 20th century, France had you no know, fewer than five prime ministers of Jewish origin. I think that basically the answer to these questions is that um, despite, I, I would say that France is an inherently anti-Semitic country. Um, I am prepared to point out four different strains currently um, in place in France of anti-Semitism, and I would go, I would, I would say that the answer to these questions is that, and the, and the main point, which um, can be drawn out of this that you kind of demonstrate um, inadvertently, perhaps, is that um, France is uh, an anti-Semitic country, but its neighbors. Are, it, it's not quite as anti-Semitic as it's made, <laughs> and therefore has sometimes accidentally, because of this accident of the French Revolution's thrust, it's accidentally tolerated Jews at times more than it's more flagrantly anti-Semitic, sometimes more flagrantly anti-Semitic neighbors. But I'd like to, 
I'd like to emphasize the last question. Moreover, if France were inherently anti-Semitic, why did French intellectuals like Amy Zola and Jean-Paul Sartre produce some of the most forceful condemnations of anti-Semitism ever written? I think that you answer this question on page 139. <laughs> the, uh, when you say in the beginning of your um, chapter on Sartre's Jewish question, the almost messianic gratitude certain French Jewish readers felt towards Sakhla's text clearly stems from its contrast with the way Jews have been attacked for decades by the nationalist right in France. That's what Zola and Sakhla were led, I mean, two people were led to take courageous stances, which you, by the way, I, well, okay, I'll get to that in a second, but, but these two people were led to take these stances because of the crushingly flagrant and oppressive force of anti-Semitism in the country actually led them to take these, uh, led them to, to make these gestures. Um, and in, the ca in both cases, actually, so you're, you're admirably, um, uh, your admirably nuanced readings in every single one of these chapters actually belie your initial gesture by demonstrating that even in all of these instances of anti-anti-Semitism, such as Zola's and Renoir's and Sartre's, in fact, there is an anti-Semitism persists. Anti if you chase <laughs> anti-Semitism out the door, it comes climbing back in the window, as Horace didn't quite say, but she's out the pitchfork. <laughs> uh, that was nature, but anti-Semitism is in fact. Um, it, that this, um, I mean, it seems to me that these questions are all answered. These rhetorical questions are all answered, but not in the way you set them out, uh, not in the way you imply um, in the course of the, uh, of the book. And also, I mean, uh, as you point out on page 164, in 2012, France had by far the largest number of anti-Semitic acts in the world, more than double that of any other country. I think that it's quixotic to attempt to, in, in, a, in a book that gives us all of this rich material, it's quixotic to start out by saying that you're, um, uh, that you were led to, well, I know, I mean, I, I'm sure that you were led to, uh, to do all this research by irritation at, um, at the constant um, suggestions you heard of France as being an inherently anti-Semitic country, but you've actually demonstrated that it is. I mean, you, you've demonstrated what's obvious anyway, which is that it is. Now, I'm going to um, stop talking very soon, but I would like to... No, okay, so let me just... So here are my four kinds of anti-Semitism, which are um, in vigorous operation today in France, and... Um, Oh, I should, I should, uh, well, it's that one standard Front National far right um, anti Semitism harking back to the uh, unfortunate movements of the um, mid 20th century that they themselves harked back. So, uh, basically, standard far right anti Semitism, one. Two, leftist pro -pal far left pro Palestinian anti Israeli militant rhetoric, which you talk about. Um, and Talk about both of these. Three, Islamist anti Semitism, which is a bit of a different breed. And number four, and I would like to put number four into uh, a bit of context by saying that I have had um, the, uh, the great opportunity, the great good fortune to have the opportunity to test this out myself by spending large amounts of time uh, among the provincial bourgeoisie in France. Um, and I am here to tell you that number four is your garden variety. Number four is the only one that <laughs> does not speak its name. Okay, number, number four it does not recognize itself. The others recognize themselves as anti-Semitists. And number four vigorously contests anyone who, <laughs> who dares to suggest this. And I have to say that, so um, I, uh, this, so this is just the general um, time-worn, um, the general time-worn anti-Semitism of the provincial bourgeoisie um, in France. Um, and uh, I mean, I have to say, so I've spent a lot of time uh, among the provincial bourgeoisie um, in, in France in recent years, actually in the recent 
in, in the last 23 years. So I, feel, um, off, off, I feel that I'm qualified to speak on this subject. And I think, now, why have I been able to see this, given that I have never made any pretense of being anything other than a New York Jew? How is it? Well, it's because I fall into so many other categories of otherness and weirdness and just Martian bizarreness that I think they just forgot. <laughs> they say even worse things when I'm not around. But no, I think they've just forgotten because I have so many other categories of of alienation that um that so that now I have actually attempted to talk about this in these circles and have discovered that um, this, so that's why I say that this is this is this is the kind of this is the anti-Semitism that dare not speak its name in France, but it's in full force um, in the provinces at least. Um, which, uh, well, anyway, I, I think that um, so yeah, I would say that um, uh, I would say that and this is what I just wrote down. This is my attempt to actually write something down um, to. Uh, um, to make a point, in spite of its manifest inherent and enduring anti-Semitism, because of the particular um, vision inaugurated by the French Revolution, um, France has sometimes and even often tolerated Jews more than its even more flagrantly anti-Semitic neighbors. But I don't think that we should. Um, I don't think that we should mistake this for lack of inherent anti-Semitism. <laughs> Um, thank you very much to our three panelists for their um, very insightful comments. Actually, I had a comment too. Um, now I feel it's a little um, maybe out of place, um, but let me let me go ahead. Um, had had a, uh, a comment about this articulation between let's say the battles and the works of art and about the 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 what the what uh, so, so we call it, the bifocal uh, view of on one hand the history on the other hand the uh, the text and the fine reading of the text. What I find um, surprising or, or, or something that I found um, should, should be discussed in your cynicism, the history is mostly a history of integration, right? It's a political history. You uh, put a huge emphasis on law and citizenship from the revolution on, and, um, and, and then the, the story of representation is more complicated, more ambiguous, with, you know, this is where you see forms of, you know, pluralism, uh, maybe a little more, um, uh, a little better articulated. But then, if your um, if your general thesis is to say that uh, the <clears throat> the status of the Jews in France has been the crucible or maybe the matrix to uh, uh, for a specific French uh, universalism, a French form of universalism, actually the Jewish status, I mean the status of the Jews <coughs> is exceptional, right? Uh, the entire history is an interesting in history of legal inclusion from the revolution on. The decree in 1870, obviously not in the south of Algeria, as you uh, remind us in your, in your book. Um, but, you know, except for the period of Vichy, which obviously is an, a legal exemption within this longer history of, of integration and, and, and should be, I mean, we feel convinced. Nothing of it. I mean, this is very specific to the Jews, right? And so, how can you say at the end of the day that that, that the, the, the Jews form a um, a model for the for integration and assimilation? Why, well, let's say, Muslims have been constantly um, uh, uh, refused this form of uh, legal integration, uh, assimilation, and integration. That citizenship has been explicitly uh, throughout the colonial history um, uh, refused to, to 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 Muslims as the group, what is interesting with the Jews is that they were in bloc, right? As a bloc, they were integrated in the French nation in the, at the moment of the revolution, the moment of the, of the Décret Crémieux in 1870, they were integrated as Jews, right? As a population. Muslim, obviously Muslim, there are lots of ways in which Muslims could become citizens throughout, even throughout the, 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 the colonial history in Algeria, but not as a group. 
And so this discrepancy, if, if you know, if the model is, a, is in the model of uh, citizenship, then this discrepancy kind of, I think, questions your very species that the Jews have been, you know, that, 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 that the, their species, I mean, that the, the French universalism hinges on uh, what, you know, the French state has done with the Jews. So that would be uh, my question. But um, I'm sure you have um, things to say about reactions or panelists' um, <laughs> comments. Uh, so you have, before we're going to open to uh, Q&A, you okay. have a few minutes. I'll be, very, I'll be very quick, and maybe I'll go uh, in reverse order. So um, starting with your question, Manuel. Um, so I'm very specifically not arguing that, and I know you weren't saying that, but just to make it clear that Jews were somehow, uh, that I'm proposing them as a model minority, you know, saying that, you know, Muslims should, which is a certain discourse that one hears in France, which is, oh, if only the Muslims had just, would just go through what the Jews did in the 19th century, everything would be okay. I'm definitely not arguing that. But what I'm just saying is that, um, these questions throughout most of the 19th century, you know, sorry, starting in the 18th century and throughout, you know, as Susan said, until about 25 years ago, uh, the, the Jews offered a kind of place for thinking through these questions precisely because I think they were exceptional and problematic in the country. And so they were kind of the limit case in, you know, so like during the French Revolution, if even if we can take even this most foreign marginal group and make them into citizens, then we can make anyone into citizens. So I think that's what I was trying to, to argue there. Um, so Elizabeth, um, clearly I haven't spent enough time with the provincial bourgeoisie. <laughs> 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 I know, you have. I know. I'm a little scared too. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I think, you know, I think a good point that is it just compared to Germany that France seems less anti semitic I think that you can say, but, you know, you could really, I think, ask that question in the United States. Absolutely. Too, yes, right? absolutely. Yeah, like how on the anti, you know, if you scratch deep enough. Well, actually, you don't have to scratch that deeply. You just have to travel uh, a little bit away from yeah. the tri-state area. Yeah. You know, for instance, you if you were to, for instance, spend 13 years in Charlottesville, Virginia, yeah. you would learn yeah. Yeah. that, yeah. in fact, yes, right here, yeah. right yeah. here in this country. So I, I totally agree with that. The Or anywhere else, for that matter. Yeah. I mean, anywhere else other than New York and Boston. Yeah. 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 No, so I totally agree with that. What I was trying to say is that there have been these unique moments in French history where something else was possible and that there's something what I, so I was kind of interested in what were the specific um, instances of that that were specifically French and that's what kind of was interesting so I, I don't disagree with you but I just was fascinated for instance that the Comédie Française uh, in 1839 would put on a play in celebration of Purim Mm -hmm. um, that seemed really oh, shocking. I'm sorry, yeah. can I just say one thing about yeah. Charlottesville, Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was an exhibit about the um, history of Jews. It was a tiny exhibit. It was like on a, on a piece of paper. <laughs> the history of Jews at the University of Virginia. And it turns out that the University of Virginia, Virginia which was founded in 1820 or something, hired its first, hired, it was like the first place in the United States to hire a Jew. They hired uh, to hire a Jew not to not to teach religious stuff. They hired some unfortunate guy to teach math. I think in like 1830, and he was hounded out of town within like a week or something. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah he, he, you know. So um, yeah, they're all history is filled. With these. Well, but uh, if I could just say one thing, since I to become a free for all. Uh, 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 Sorry. The point is. Warren's book is not so much about anti-Semitism. He gave us that example in the beginning, and you did beautifully in, in picking it in picking it apart. And, and, and I think in many ways you're absolutely right about those four kinds of anti-Semitism. But if I understood correctly, the argument is not about anti-Semitism, and it's why you gave up your original project to write about French philo-Semitism. Yeah. That was the original. The project is really to talk about the whole concept of 
universalism in France, which has become a kind of a whipping boy for a lot of people, but also a very important uh, idea for many French people. I mean, if you talk to the French consul, the French ambassador, the French anybody, they will always talk about laïcité. Mm -hmm. And laïcité is linked to universalism. That is, we need to be free from all religion, as you point out, free from rather than freedom, freedom from religion rather than freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. So, so your book is really about that. Your, your book yeah. is really not about, it's not an attempt to deal with the history or not from anti-Semitism in France. It's about the whole concept of the universal and whether it can tolerate difference. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. Not, but in other words, you're, yeah. you're, you're taking a, you're, you're in a way shifting the ground. Well, I actually the, think that he shifted the ground. Okay. Because yeah. he starts out announcing what he's going to do and then does something else. It is actually not a free for all. <laughs> And then back to Marie and then to the room. Okay, and I'll, I'll be quick. Yeah, and I did, I think that partly that, that part at the beginning was when I was laying out what the book was originally going to be about, which was about philosemitism, and then it wound up being, becoming about something else, as, as we said. Um, so, uh, Clemence, um, you got lots of really interesting things. I you really pointed to something that um, I feel like is a big part of the book that, um, you know, got said, but I wanted to say again, which is trying to think through, trying to look at um, cultural expressions as political theory, and trying to say that not only, you know, political theorists have the right to think about these questions, and that you have to take culture and art seriously as a space for thinking about things, and maybe that cultural productions become more uh, likely spaces to work out alternative uh, alternatives to dominant narratives than actual political theory. And maybe that's just an excuse because I'm a literary scholar working on these topics and I needed to justify myself, but I do actually believe that, so thank you. Um, the question about Sarah Bernhardt is is a great one, and that, um, you know, she explicitly modeled herself on Rochelle, yeah, and um, she, of course, fits into this, but it's coming at a, at a later moment when anti-Semitism is becoming much more explicit uh, during the Dreyfus affair. Um, whether there's a link between Jewishness and performance, I think definitely, and other people have, have written about that, and it's a really interesting one, and I was really struck by how many Jewish performers there were in the 1840s. I was looking through a dictionary of theatrical performers from, from the period, and so many, including all of Rochelle's siblings, and there were like you know seven of them. Um, and a very interesting book that just came out um, by Jonathan Hess is about um, uh, this play called Deborah, which was a play about a kind of suffering Jewish woman that became a huge international theatrical phenomenon in the 19th century, including in the US, and he traces all the different uh, ways that Jewishness was performed uh, on stage, um, often by non-Jews. Um, and then Susan, uh, I'll just focus on what I think is you know, kind of the big question here, which is um, you know, what does this exceptionalism say about the future? Uh, am I positive? Am I sort of, um, you know, uh, how negative am I about about the future? And um, and you know, are Muslims the, the new Jews in France? Um, you know, I think that uh, as I say in the book, I don't want to minimize at all the the differences, but you know, between. Jews and you know the integration of those two communities and the you know in a way you know much more difficult problems um, you know or dif difficult in a different way problems that Muslims face today integrating um, but you know am I how, how uh, pessimistic am I um, I think things are pretty bad, you know, but, and I think they're pretty bad here too, obviously. Um, especially because what we've discovered is that, you know, um, this old right-wing form of, 
you know, um, hating you know, Jews has not disappeared as many people thought it was. In fact, it's still there with all kinds of the other ones that Elizabeth pointed to. But uh, I, I think I am, you know, hopeful in a certain way that things, you know, can work themselves out because, precisely because there have been these more positive moments in the past. There are writers and artists and filmmakers who are thinking through these questions very passionately, and I think they do offer us alternatives. So, you know, are they going to win out anytime soon? Who knows? But at least they're there, and there are people doing it. So, it's up there. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have time for questions. Here, first question. And so there's a mic security voice. Hello. The laws of 1790-91 did not arise out of nowhere. They arose out of the bed of ideas that came from the Enlightenment, and namely the emphasis on the need for toleration and gradually full rights to both Protestants and uh, Jews. And so that idea was founded in the notion of equality before the law, but also the acceptance of the difference of religions. And now where does, well maybe did in one of your comments mention, after all, Napoleon's uh, institution of the consistoire, not only the Jews, but also for Protestants, so that gave a legal foundation for religious pluralism in France. It might very well be that the law of 1905 uh, gave birth to a more um, rigid form of universalism in reaction perhaps both to the Dreyfus affair as well as to the role of the Catholic Church and French Catholics <coughs> against the Republic uh, in the last decades of the 19th century. So that what is being talked about is universalism. Nowadays, since you mentioned evolution, is a further drift away from what were the original grounds for civil, full civil and political rights for Jews in 1790-91. Yeah. Thank you uh, for those comments. And uh, you know, you're totally right that uh, the emancipation didn't come out of nowhere. And in fact, I start the book with the, these earlier 18th century ways of defending the Jews. And there was a, you know, uh, a huge outpouring of writing on this question in the 1780s, and I look at specifically why that was. Um, and, but what I try to show is that there was a qualitative difference between the way people defended the Jews uh, in the decade leading up to the revolution and then the revolution on. And the big difference is that all of those defenses of the Jews in the 1780s, before the revolution, were predicated on assimilation as the goal. Um, so the Abbe Grégoire and all these people, in some form or another, thought that the Jews needed to change some aspect of either their economic identity or their religious identity for some, or their cultural identity, in different ways. Um, you start to get a different discourse during the revolution, where uh, you start to get that we should make Jews citizens because everyone should be a citizen. And I, so I try to look at what that is about, which I think is the universalist um, kind of notion. Totally right about Napoleon, who of course um, did some very you know, good things and also some, some more difficult things. So he, um, you could argue that uh, Napoleon you know, created the Jewish the consistoire, as you said, and tried to make Judaism a state religion in France. Um, he also, um, though, in a sense, took away emancipation, it could be argued. I have a colleague who is arguing that with the 1808 infamous decree, 
which applied only to Jews, and really only to Jews in Alsace, where Jews, it was a it's kind of, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but it said that Jewish money lenders in Alsace could not, did not have to be repaid unless they could show some certain kind of documentation that none of them could. And that was a law that only applied to Jews. Also, the Jews alone couldn't uh, hire someone to replace them in the army. Um, so these are kind of shocking uh, exceptions to the French universalist principle. And interestingly, so it was a 10-year decree, and he made it explicitly with the goal of the Jews haven't assimilated enough. We need to force the issue. And he was responding to critic, you know, kind of anti-Semites in Alsace. Also, and so it was set to expire in 1818. And interestingly, the restoration, which we think of as a very conservative that you know made sacrilege punishable by death in France, it was a return to a certain kind of you know state Catholicism. Did chose not to renew the infamous decree um, in 1818, which is interesting. Um, and then certainly, you know, the 1905 and the separation of church and state, uh, which is a big, you know, kind of turning point, um, and that it, you know, it happened for a reason in France, as a reaction, as you said, you know, to the, the what was perceived as the, you know, nefarious role of the Catholic Church um, during the, you know, the Dreyfus affair. But um, what I try to show is that before 1905, um, laïcité didn't mean the rigorous uh, banishment of religion from the public sphere, but it meant that the three major religions, so Catholicism, Protestantism, and Judaism, needed to be treated equally in France. Um, and even if you look at the text of the 1905, it's much less hard line than, uh, you know, than, than we think now. Yeah. So. First of all, uh, thank you so much for the discussion. I, I came here to learn something, and I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I'd like to just, uh, just mention that uh, I very much appreciated, from an academic point of view, all of the facts that you reported. Uh, it was very enlightening. But uh, I must also say that apart from factual enlightenment, I thoroughly enjoyed what Elizabeth said. Because I recently uh, spent the summer with my husband on an army base in Israel as a volunteer. And the two young Jewish girls who were in the army, who were helping us acclimate, came from France. And one was 18 years old, the other was 20. One was a very sophisticated, beautiful Parisian girl, the other came from Marseille. Now, why are they in Israel? They were not religious. They were not Zionists. But obviously, the anti-Semitism that exists in France sent them to Israel for security. And they were the ones who were going to, uh, I guess, uh, survey the situation and then ask the rest of their family to come over. So, um, this is the situation. Now, you speak about universalism. What does that tell us about universalism? Does it really uh, exist there that everyone's going to be accepted and everyone, I mean, maybe, maybe you're, you're thinking that the Muslims will accept, will uh, uh, assimilate, but if it's done at the cost of Jews having to run away from their own country, I mean, this is a very complex issue, but I think that Maurice's points and Elizabeth's points were marvelous. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, you know, certainly it's, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's certainly a, a, a phenomenon now that, that uh, you know, France used to, throughout most of its, you know, the last um, 70 years, sent the fewest Jews to Israel, and now it's the country that is sending the most. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's certainly a reason for concern that the Jews feel unsafe there, and I think, you know, that's something that, you know, that a lot of people are thinking about and, and trying to address, and that I kind of look at in the, the last chapter in, in the conclusion, and I certainly don't want to 
you know, deny that, you know, that that's the case, that, um, you know, so, yeah, so I thank you for that comment. Um, there are lots of questions, there is a little time, so please, if you don't mind, keep your question rather short, so that I don't I'll keep my answer short. I'm sorry about that, but I would like to have, you know, as many people as possible to hear you, Thank you all, this has been so interesting. Um, I'm wondering, more. you start obviously with the French Revolution. It's such a pivotal moment, and I'm wondering if there is not, and Elizabeth, if you'd agree with this, a fault line that has never really been covered over in France, which is the, the anti-republicanism of certainly of a great part of the provincial bourgeoisie, many of whom are still monarchists, actually, and that that kind of garden variety anti-Semitism really can be traced back to a fundamental anti-Republicanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a great point, and, and I would just say that, you know, it is an interesting phenomenon in France that um, Jews become, throughout the 19th century, identified with the Republic, and so a lot of, and Pierre Birnbaum, of course, has, you know, written a great book on this, um, you know, uh, both how the Jews became over-identified themselves, there's a book called Le Fou de la République about, you know, Jews who identified with the state, but then also um, he's looked at how anti-Semitism in the 19th century specifically takes that form of anti-republic, and it becomes those who are hostile to the republic become anti-Semites. So if, if I may, I have a lot of this just also anti-Semitism. <laughs> 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 Could you say that again? I, I would add that you know you don't need to go to the public to the provinces. You just go to some you know nice dinners in yeah. Paris. Oh yeah. yeah. To get the hotel. Yeah. No, what I said was I think that a lot of it is just kind of something. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Here, one question here. Your this very interesting discussion of universalism reminded me of American discussions of exceptionalism. And I was wondering, as American exceptionalism has been an ideological cover, essentially, for aggression and colonialism, whether universalism can be an co ideological cover for bigotry and anti-Semitism. Yes, I think I think that's true, and uh, you know I'm suspicious of all kinds of exceptionalism, and I think you know uh, we've just seen this recently. You know, American exceptionalism—it could never happen here. America is immune to fascism. We're the exception. Okay, well, you know, it's maybe not the case, and um, certainly you know exceptionalism has been a big part of you know the exception française has been a big part of French ideology, and sure, it, it gets um, used in all kinds of nefarious ways. Um, so the, another question that I thought of is what do French Jews think of universalism? And I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a young French Jew in Paris who was very plugged into the Jewish community. His feeling was that in Paris, anti-Semitism was not such a big problem. In the provinces, it was. And that there was a tension within the Jewish community as to how to react to the Muslim question. White groups felt, let's keep our heads down. Let's benefit from this and let all the hatred go in that direction. Another group felt that our traditional values make it imperative for us to identify with the Muslims and do what we can for them, even to our own peril. And he thought that the third group felt that we had to defend the Muslims because in doing that, we were defending ourselves. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, well, first of all, I should say that um, I specifically decided in this book to focus on non, what non-Jewish writers have said about Jews, because in my last book, I wrote about Jewish writers, and so I, I, that was one thing. But I think you, in a sense, answered the question by showing that, of course, there's no one French Jewish response to these things. You know, the French Jewish community is very complex and, um, you know, starting with uh, the difference between um, Ashkenazic Jews and Sephardic Jews who are there, um, all kinds of class differences. And I would say that the uh, opinions about these questions vary greatly according to those, you know, divisions, but not only according to those divisions, so sometimes you, you know, so I think there's a whole range of, um, I've talked to French Jews who feel uh, despairing of the situation and like they need to leave, and then talk to other French Jews who feel like this, none of this is affecting them at all, and, um, you know, or they've seen much worse, you know, before, and, you know, so I think that it's, um, you know, there are definitely multiple books to be written on that. This is a very short, <coughs> very short question. I was intrigued by the idea of Jews and performance. And it occurred to me that the person of Simone Weil might be said to be performing the role of a Christian saint. Um, yeah. um, and, I, and I wondered what, what you thought about that and whether there were other, other Jews who did similar, similar things. Yeah, um, I have not that much to say about her. I find her a kind of troubling and, and fascinating figure. Uh, but um, my new project is actually moving a lot about uh, a conversion, so Jews who converted um, in France, which I think is its own you know, troubling thing. I would just point out that France actually had much lower rates of conversion than Germany, certainly, or than other countries, partially for these reasons, because of universalism, because in fact the Jews in France had little to gain from it, and so there were a couple you know, there were about five conversions a year only in the 19th century. So it's an interesting, but that is, it is an interesting, uh, whether she's performing, you know, and to what extent is conversion and performance also, I think, is a question. How can we, can we ever really know? I mean, she's the ultimate example of someone who converts not for any She didn't convert. She oh, she didn't, didn't convert. She okay. Oh, she she did okay. not she, but she, she acted like it. As if she but had, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so it's in it, that's it. Simone Day did not convert, technically. She did what? She didn't think she was worthy. Simone Day, the philosopher, right? Not the yeah, not the, 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 the politician. Uh, I, okay, this is a question that's unresolvable, so I'll pose it. I'd just like to think about it. Uh, I appreciated that the panel had many facets to it. Something that has concerned me in my research is the fact that while 76,000 Jews were deported and most of them killed, and mostly foreign Jews, three quarters of the French, the Jewish population in France survived, which meant there were a lot of people who helped them or hid them or you know did whatever. But the second thing is, um, uh, so anyway, that's one of the contradictions. Uh, the other contradiction, or not a contradiction, but a kind of hopeful sign is a book like a, Will and I have experienced uh, uh, Delphine Gauvinier, the uh, rabbi, uh, the woman rabbi, one of three women rabbis in France who's part of the liberal Jewish movement, who's very, very articulate. She did the eulogy for Chantal Ackerman. And, you know, so there's, there's this kind of resurgence and respect for Jews and people of the book and, and a, a, a respect of that, which is you know, part of the kind of underground resistance to the anti-Semitism which manifests itself in one way or another. If I may say so, the greatest enemies of uh, the female female now are within the community. She gets attacked all yep. the time, and so that also goes to show you how many, and we cannot say, talk about, you know, and it's, and not, it's a very multi-layered community, so. As it has always been. Yes. Yeah. And, uh,
October. Actually, let me say that the Fino River is going to come down to the uh, next October. Mm -hmm. For some of the reasons that I decided not to write the book about Philo <laughs> <laughs> because it's you know very complex and slippery, including also the huge issue of uh, people who say hidden Jews and say Jews in France, and, and you know that's just a whole other. Okay. Okay. Uh, on this note, uh, thank you so much to our three panelists.